Uh, to uh, President Capilouto and the staff and faculty of this outstanding institution, thank you for hosting me. Thank you for welcoming me. It is a continuation of the welcome that I have felt this entire day here in Kentucky between Richmond and Lexington and between uh, my staff and I have been greeted with warmth, with hospitality and support. And so I thank you all for that, in particular on, for the, from the university's perspective. Thank you so much for hosting this important forum. And thank you for the work that you've done in this vital, vital area. Um, as Carrie mentioned, there'll be a panel right after my discussion points with you to talk in depth about this issue. And let me thank those panelists also in advance for their work uh, as well. Carrie, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you for your work, your dedicated service to the people of the Department of Justice and the Eastern District of Kentucky, and thank you for your friendship over the years. I have been privileged to sit beside you as U.S. attorneys, and I am so honored to work with you now uh, as you lead this fight here. Uh, but we're also joined uh, by two other U.S. attorney colleagues here. I'm looking for my U.S. attorneys, John Kuhn and Ben Glassman from Western Kentucky and Southern Ohio, districts that share this problem and this concern. So I thank them for coming and lending their voice as well. Uh, the U.S. attorneys operate um, independently in many, many, many ways, as I know from personal experience. Uh, but they also have the great support of the Executive Office for U.S. Attorneys. And so when Kerry comes to Washington to get resources to carry out his policies and carry out the things he wants to do. Uh, he goes to my colleague, Monty Wilkinson, who's also traveled from DC here with me today uh, to work on this issue, to understand uh, what Kerry will need and to provide assistance as well. So let me thank all of my DOJ colleagues for joining me today, but also every day in this fight. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's really a privilege, really, for me to be here with this outstanding group so many law enforcement officers, scholars, students, and public servants as we begin and can, for many of us continue this vital discussion about how we can work together to confront the opioid crisis that is gripping our nation. Because by doing so, we'll be building stronger and safer communities and ensuring healthier and brighter futures for every American. And of course, as we know, every American is at risk. No one is immune from this. The explosion in opioid and heroin abuse in the United States in recent years is truly an epidemic. It is. No one is immune, no individual, no family, no community. Opioid abuse knows no boundaries. It cuts across any line that we can draw of race, age, gender, wealth. It cuts across the lines of cities, suburbs, it hits rural towns, it hits tribal communities. Now, just a few weeks ago, the Department of Health and Human Services released new numbers showing that 3.8 million people, 3.8 million people ages 12 and up are currently misusing prescription pain relievers in our country. And that's just the prescription pain relievers in our country. This is a stunning indication of how widespread this phenomenon has become. And I will tell you, I was stunned not just at the number of 3.8 million people, but that they, we are counting this issue down as young as 12. That is also stunning to me, but that is our reality. Those are the issues that we face. And those of us who've been dealing with this issue and living with this issue know we have to look even younger to make sure we have the educational programs in hand to, to give our children the tools they need not to fall prey to this. Now, in order to advance the fight against opioids, President Obama has proclaimed this week as Prescription Opioid and Heroin Epidemic Awareness Week. And that's what brings me here to the Lexington area today. Now, since Sunday, the Department of Justice has been joining with our partners across the federal government. This is an all-hands-on-deck issue. So we're joining with our partners across government and at the state and local levels to hold dozens of events like this one across the country. This week is going to shine a spotlight from coast to coast. We're drawing attention to the urgency of heroin and prescription opioid abuse. And as our hope is to improve the public's understanding of just how destructive this epidemic is. 
and we're enlisting the public's support for our ongoing work to roll back this disturbing trend. Now, I know that for many of you, my words are very familiar, because I know that here in Kentucky, you have experienced the ravages of the heroin and opioid epidemic with particular viciousness. It has hit hard here. And just last year, this state lost more than 1,200 of its people, of its sons and daughters, of its sisters and brothers, of its children, to drug overdoses, an increase of nearly 15% over 2014. And more than a quarter of those fatalities were due to heroin overdoses. More than a third were caused by fentanyl. Fentanyl, as many of you know, is a drug that is up to 100 times more powerful than morphine. Now, these numbers are truly chilling, but they only tell part of the story. Now, earlier today, I was privileged and, and honored and humbled to meet with a group of parents and family members who've lost their children to overdoses. Some of them have joined me here today, and I thank them for continuing to tell their stories. And of course, as you can imagine, those stories were devastating. But I will tell you, their resolve to spare other parents, other family members, other siblings, the same fate is inspiring. To be able to draw upon the deepest tragedy of your heart and turn it into a gift for someone else is to really leave a blessing behind. So let me thank everyone from the HEAT Team Initiative with whom I met today, and please let me honor them as well. And when I was talking with the family members, I was reminded of the great truth that we must never forget as we confront this crisis, that those that we are losing to the heroin opio and opioid epidemic are more than a number. They're more than a statistic. They're more than a scholarly article, the subject of one. They are our children. They are our siblings. They are our friends, our neighbors. They are our fellow Americans. And even if we do not personally know someone who has struggled with opioid issues, the consequences of this scourge ripple outward, affecting each and every one of us every day because it erodes opportunity. It diminishes public safety. And it undermines our communities and tears at the fabric of our common life as Americans. And so, as Americans, we have a shared responsibility to end it, end it, as swiftly as possible. Now, I want to assure you, I want to commit to you, that the Department of Justice is committed to helping Kentucky overcome this devastating epidemic. And we're determined to do everything that we can to ensure that not one more parent has to endure the harrowing loss of a child. And under the excellent leadership of U.S. Attorney Harvey, the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the Eastern District of Kentucky is working closely with DEA task forces and state and local law enforcement to prioritize prosecutions that will reduce the supply of heroin, fentanyl, and other opioids. And that, that mission, that mandate is shared by our U.S. Attorney colleagues in Western Kentucky and Ohio as well, I know. We're funneling our resources toward the most impactful cases. We're employing new strategies and approaches to, to enable us to go after the bad actors. And through the U.S. Attorney's Heroin Education Action Team, the HEAT team that I mentioned, we are also inviting the relatives of these overdose victims to help us raise awareness about the dangers of opioids. And this is a program that we hope to replicate throughout many offices across this country. Now, we are also helping to collect excess and expired prescriptions, keeping them out of the wrong hands. And today, I am extremely proud to announce that in terms of concrete support, more than $8.8 .8 million in new funding under our Harold Rogers Prescription Drug Monitoring Grant Program, named for the congressman from Kentucky's 5th District. These grants are rolling out now. These grants are going to help 20 organizations nationwide, including the Kentucky Cabinet for Health and Family Services, enhance their monitoring tools, and to further develop the innovative, data-driven responses to this crisis. And I want to congratulate these latest grantees and commend them for their tireless efforts. 
Now, the work that we're doing in Kentucky, I just mentioned a little bit about it, is part of our larger nationwide effort to combat this epidemic through enforcement, through prevention and diversion, and most importantly, through treatment. Let me talk a little bit about the enforcement front. I've mentioned a few things that we're focusing on here in Eastern Kentucky. But on the overall enforcement front, we are significantly expanding all of our investigations into heroin and opioid traffickers. We've launched a national heroin initiative under our Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Forces program. We call that OSADEF. And OSADEF focuses on the operational and financial infrastructure of large-scale drug trafficking organizations. OSADEF brings together representatives from a number of agencies. It is truly cross-cutting. U.S. Attorney's Offices, DEA, FBI, ATF, U.S. Marshals Service, and the Coast Guard, very, very important in this fight, creating a broad law enforcement effort that targets international drug trafficking syndicates at their roots. Also, however, our Office of Community-Oriented Policing, we call it the COPS Office, is funding law enforcement agencies in especially hard-hit districts through its anti-methamphetamine program and anti-heroin task force program. And in these and so many other ways, the Department of Justice is bringing all of our law enforcement assets to bear on the criminals who are responsible for flooding communities with illegal narcotics. And we are seeing results. We are. Just since 2011, the DEA has opened more than 11,000 heroin-related investigations. And in fiscal year 2015, we made more than 6,000 heroin-related arrests, an increase of 190% since 2007. We are focusing our enforcement efforts on this problem because we have to stop the pipeline of poison into our communities. Now, I could not be prouder of the teams that are working on this effort, as well as the local partners on whom we rely each and every day. But arrests and prosecutions will not end the opioid epidemic on their own. We cannot prosecute our way out of this problem, because in so many cases, it isn't trafficking rings that introduce a person to opioids. It's the household medicine cabinet. That's the source. And that is why we are also engaging with drug manufacturers, with wholesalers, with pharmacies and doctors. Under DEA's 360 strategy, we are encouraging them to follow responsible distribution and prescription practices. Now, the 360 strategy has also resulted in a partnership with Discovery Education, with whom we've developed an opioid and heroin curriculum for middle school, for high school students, their teachers, and their parents. It's called Operation Prevention. And this curriculum is going to be available online at no cost to schools nationwide. And it will be rolled out during Red Ribbon Week next month. No cost, all schools nationwide. And through efforts like this week of national awareness, we are also encouraging ordinary Americans to take simple steps that can make a big difference. Things as small as locking their medicine cabinets. And we continue to facilitate the safe disposal of expired and unwanted medications through DEA's National Take Back Days. And last spring, we collected over 440 tons, tons, of unwanted medications at more than 5,000 sites across the country. It may not solve all of this problem, but we have to start with that. And I encourage the public to take advantage of this free and anonymous opportunity at the next Take Back Day, scheduled for this October 22nd. And finally, I'm tremendously proud to announce that DEA has taken a significant step to recognize the unique challenges that are posed by unlawfully diverted prescription drugs. And in fact, the head of the DEA's Diversion Control Division has been elevated to a top leadership post, reflecting the department's commitment to an anti-opioid strategy that extends beyond traditional law enforcement work and deals with the issue of drugs being diverted out of the mainstream, doctors selling them, people unlawfully obtaining them. Now, of course, we all know that when individuals do fall into the clutches of addiction, 
We have a responsibility to help them heal. We have an, a responsibility to help them recover. And we have an obligation to help them overcome the debilitating disease of addiction. Now, as law enforcement officers, that responsibility often means helping heroin and opioid abusers in the most perilous moments of an overdose, when seconds count, when lives, literally lives, are at stake. And to prepare local law enforcement for these emergencies, which are sadly becoming all too common, my predecessor, Attorney General Eric Holder, urged officers to carry naloxone, commonly referred to as Narcan. Narcan can help restore breathing after an overdose. We urge them to carry it as part of their standard equipment. And since then, our Bureau of Justice Assistance, one of the funding arms of DOJ, has assembled a law enforcement naloxone toolkit to help state and local agencies establish their own naloxone programs. But we're also looking at enlarging and growing the substance abuse programs available to inmates in our Federal Bureau of Prisons facilities, because we have an obligation to deal with that problem as well, and not return people home still struggling with addiction. Ranging from preliminary educational courses to intensive treatment, these offerings are essential to helping, new, helping these inmates embark on a new path of purpose and productivity when they return home. And we're also supporting initiatives to divert opioid and heroin abusers from incarceration in the first place. We have to deal with this as a disease of addiction, not a crime. So we're focused on drug courts for juvenile and adult offenders. 12 of our US Attorney's offices have worked with the judiciary, the judges in their district, to establish pre-sentence diversion courts that deal with drug-related issues. And our Office of Justice programs funds a wide range of local alternatives to incarceration that reduce drug use, that diminish recidivism, and that also save precious taxpayer dollars. Now, I've outlined a number of things that, that we're working on in the Department of Justice in conjunction with our state and local partners, and that many of you here in this room are committed to as well. But all of our efforts to curb this opioid epidemic rely on one crucial ingredient. It cuts across every issue, and that issue is better data, better information, better insight into who's falling prey, into where it's coming from, and how we can cut this off. The prescription drug monitoring programs, or PDMPs, have proven to be one of our most effective tools for reducing prescription drug abuse. Now, some of you may know this term, but PDMPs are centralized, state-run databases, and they allow regulatory bodies, law enforcement agencies, and public health officials to collect and analyze data on controlled substance prescriptions. So we see who is prescribing. Most importantly, we see which patients are receiving these prescriptions. 49 states, the District of Columbia and Guam, all have active PDMPs, but few are as effective, actually, as the one that you're operating right here in Kentucky. Now, according to a study that was conducted by the University of Kentucky and funded by our Bureau of Justice Assistance, one year, just one year after prescribers were required to register with the state database, doctor shopping dropped by more than 50%. The total number of controlled substance prescriptions declined and 24 non-doctor-owned pain management facilities closed their doors. This is putting a, a handle and tightening the noose on the flow of prescription opioids to those who are at risk of abusing them. And I want to take this opportunity to thank this university for your assistance and for your support in this groundbreaking area. You were and are an invaluable partner, and I thank you. Now those are meaningful achievements, and the Justice Department is working to help other states make similar strides through the Harold Rogers grant program that I mentioned earlier and through other uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance matters. And in fact, the great work that is being done here in Kentucky is a model that should be replicated around the country. We will be looking to you 
as an example for other states. In fact, today, I have written a letter to the governor of every state in this union calling on them to adopt PDMP best practices and to work more closely with the Department of Justice to improve the data sharing of this vital information from doctors and pharmacists about these prescriptions, both within their states and between neighboring states. And these are just a few of the ways that we in the Department of Justice are striving alongside of partners like you. And believe me, we cannot do it without you as our partners. We're striving to put an end to this crisis both here in Kentucky and across the United States. Now we know that despite this week of awareness, we will not end this problem in seven days or overnight. Addiction is a powerful disease. The criminal adversaries that seek to exploit our children's weaknesses are often elusive and they are well-funded. And I know that at times, particularly when you are staring into the abyss, it can seem as if we are literally helpless in the face of this epidemic, which causes so much pain and heartbreak in so many communities and can destroy lives and opportunity and leave us bereft of hope. But my friends, my message to you today is that we are neither helpless nor hopeless because I am confident, I believe that the road ahead of us, even though it's long and fraught with difficulties, it is a road over which it will take us to success. We will prevail over heroin and opioid abuse in the end. Because ultimately, the real goal, the real cure, the real core of addressing this crisis is about helping our neighbors. It is about looking after our friends. It's about saving our children and taking care of our own. And that's what we do. That's what we do best as Americans, as humans, as people in this beautiful state and this beautiful city. And the virtues of community and of compassion have carried us through dark passages in the past, and they will carry us through this again. As I look around this room at all of you, all of the advocates and professionals, at the sheer commitment, at the sheer determination, the force of will that I have encountered in this state today, I know that those virtues will not fail us now. Together, we will continue to be relentless in our pursuit of those who illegally traffic in opioids. We will continue to teach our children about the dangers of these powerful drugs, and we will, we will and we must continue to help those in the clutches of addiction to seek help, to embrace hope, and to reclaim their lives. We will, we can, and we must. And each and every one of you is making a vital contribution to that effort. And I want to thank you for all that you've done and all that you will continue to do. You carry this banner. I commend your determination, your resilience, your tenacity. And I pledge to you, on the word of the Attorney General of the United States, that this Department of Justice, and indeed the entire Obama administration, will continue to do everything in our power to stand beside you, to support you, and to lean on you as we all, together, turn the tide on the heroin and opioid addiction in the United States. Thank you for your work in this area. Thank you for co your commitment to this cause. And most importantly, thank you for caring about all of our children who were caught in this grip and for working to free them. Thank you so very, very much.